welcome everyone to Geo Hug. Um, so this week's rock star is Ivy Chen. So Ivy's been involved in the minerals industry for over 30 years in geology, mining, resource estimation, and management. And she's currently a principal consultant at CSA Global. And what made me really want to try and get her onto GeoHub was to hear her insights since being recognized as 100 Global inspiration, Inspirational Women in Mining in 2020 by the Women in Mining UK. So I really thought that with her experience that she'd have some great insights. Um, yeah, exactly on the diversity. It's more than just getting skirts on the board. So thank you so much, Ivy, for joining us. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Jess, and hello, everyone. I'm now going to risk tech failure and try and share my screen, so bear with me while I do that. The diversity. And um, no, uh, Daniel's joke earlier about the tomato was entirely appropriate in this session on diversity. But diversity brings benefits to our industry in a rapidly changing world. So previously, diversity was seen largely in terms of getting more women involved, which is a very important goal. And we're starting to make headway in this direction, both in terms of attracting more women to join the industry, as well as increasing the number of women in the executive and board ranks. But diversity is so much more. And we need to extend our view of diversity to also open up our industry to people of different age groups, to people of different physical abilities, to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, to migrants, to full-time and part-time workers, just a few branches on our amazing diversity tree. So the true depth of diversity needs to encompass gender, language, culture, age, ability, experience, fields of study to allow the minerals industry to take advantage of opportunities and develop strategies in areas we've never considered before. And this is part of the sustainable future of our industry and the challenge for all of us who are currently in the industry to work on. Our society and community standards are changing and we have to change also to make sure that we remain sustainable and to retain our license to continue operating. And we really don't want to be those dinosaurs looking up at, at the meteorite going, oh, dot, dot, dot. So back to the issue of gender for a little bit longer. Most women would be familiar with this graphic. And I nicked this from an article two years ago. And the numbers might have changed slightly, but not in any significant way. There's still more men named John, including you, John Taylor, who then women on boards and uh, on chairs and CEOs of the ASX 200 companies. And the same goes for men named Peter or David. The stats are about the same for large and small minerals companies. And most companies have realized that this issue needs to be addressed. And there's been an increase in the number of women being, being appointed to boards. But like the men, it's a small select group of women with all the right connections. And the term golden skirts has been coined for this elite group of women. But still, it's change. And it's a slight increase in diversity. And that is a good thing. So this is the same graph. Slightly different stats, but I'm just using the numbers as an illustration now. So this is not research, this is anecdotal. I don't think anyone would dispute that this is quite a likely scenario also. Many dads who are the primary carers for their children would encounter this situation. And if they're lucky, they will get told how wonderful they are for taking on the primary care responsibilities. But very often, they get looks like they're Martians or people assume that they're babysitting for the day or that they're just plain incapable of looking after their own children and they get asked where mum is. And this is also a diversity issue. We don't support fathers in non-traditional non roles very well yet. It was probably easier for me as a young female Asian geologist to make my way in the mining industry over 30 years ago than it is today for a young dad to be the primary carer for his kids. And we can do better. Diversity has so many different perspectives and that's the whole point of diversity with many different ways of looking for solutions. Only about half of people of working age with disabilities are employed compared to about 80% of those without a disability. And these are challenging stats. And in our industry, they may be even more skewed. 
I didn't have enough time to find the stats that are pertinent to our industry. But we have a very narrow range of people who work within our industry. And again, we're getting better, but we could evolve a little faster. The increasing range of autonomous equipment allows people who have different abilities to work with us. You no longer have to climb the staircase to reach the cab of the whole truck to operate it. You don't even have to be on the mine sometimes. The remote operation centers near Perth Airport allow operators to remotely operate equipment. Someone could do that in a wheelchair or even with prosthesis. And as an interesting aside, going back again to the last century when I started out as a young geo, our industry has actually become less diverse over the last couple of decades and we're only starting to turn that around again. On my first job as a pit sampler, I worked with this blast hole driller who had an artificial leg. He was a Vietnam vet and he used to stash a hip flask in his leg and had the odd nip from time to time over the 10 hour shift. He was never drunk, but he would have certainly been over the limit from time to time. I'm not, certainly not saying we should go back to this, but only to illustrate that in the late eighties, I worked with a driller who had a disability and no one thought it was unusual. It was just how he was. I've also used to work with other drillers and truck drivers from the former Yugoslavia and from Turkey who had very basic English. People who today would probably find it more difficult to get a look in on many mine jobs. And mine sites are often seen as places for younger people because of the perceived physical nature of the work. And in some of the work that we do, yeah, this is the case. But just because someone may be older, it doesn't necessarily mean that they cannot do the work. And again, there's the other side. When is a manager too young? Does someone really need to have gray hair before they know what they're doing or how to make it easier for other people to do their work? I used to work with this lady who was a shop fire's offsider. She was well into her late forties, which to a young geo of 20 something was positively ancient. And she could lug the 18 kilo bags of Amphro around as easily as any of the other crew members. And she also had tattoos in the most interesting spots. She would show off at the bar after many beverages, but she's another diverse character who probably no longer exists in today's mining industry. And on a more serious note, we are looking at another skill shortage in our industry. And if we keep on this too old, too young, too not like me, Jay, we will not be able to keep our industry going. We're going to run out of people. We have to look for what people can do and not what we think they cannot do. And we're not going to make, we're not doing enough to make sure that the highly experienced people in our industry are retained to pass their skills and experience onto the next generation. Too quickly, we retrench the most experienced people in a downturn because sometimes, and not quite often, they're paid more. And then we're reluctant to hire inexperienced young people because we have to train them. And yes, we do. That is how we get good people to work with, to keep experienced people, to bring on young people and, and to share the skills and experience and the knowledge around because younger people also have different knowledge and skills to share with the experienced workforce. One really good change that is happening in our industry is the increasing involvement of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Get Into Mining is a collaborative program run by Aboriginal owned mining and civil contracting company, Kerry Mining, with the support of mining contractor McMahon Holdings and Tropicana Joint Venture Partners, Anglo Galashanti Australia and Independence Group. McMahon Holdings and Kerry Mining are also both contractors at Tropicana. So this photo shows eight trainees who graduated from the Get Into Mining training program, I think in November last year, and they secured industry traineeships. And we can still do more. Employing Indigenous Australians is a great start. We also need to extend the way we formulate strategy to include consideration for the heritage and culture of traditional owners of the land we work on. The Jungan Gorge decision was made on profit, and that is absolutely critical. It's possible, though, that with greater diversity among the decision makers or in the decision making process, Someone might have queried if that was the only possible decision or if there was another way. And this is the last category I'm going to talk about today, migrants. So many migrants have difficulty finding jobs 
where they're highly, for which they are highly qualified and have the experience to do. How many of us have had office cleaners who are chemical engineers in their own country or ridden a taxi driven by someone who has a PhD in molecular biology? We have standards for recognition of formal training and it's important that we ensure the people who are trusted to do certain critical work are qualified to do so. But often, migrants have passed all these tests and obtained the necessary certification, but they have great difficulty in landing that first job that will open doors for them because the people making the hiring decisions are worried that they will not fit the culture of the organization or perhaps that they will not be able to communicate clearly. The other side of this coin is to consider that migrants may have different perspectives to contribute, extending the culture of the organization and that communicating with someone from another culture and language may make us realize that some of our assumptions may not be quite as strong as we thought they were. So I am a migrant and now I sound like I've lived here for many years and I have, but I'm also adaptable. You know, like, I talk like this, like when I'm at home with the family, we, you know, we speak English all the time, but we speak it differently. So which person am I? I'm both and I'm more. I also speak to other languages. Sekarang saya bercakap bahasa Malaysia. Yang ni kan ngokong kan kong fu. And the diversity that migrants can add to the way we solve problems is really well worth considering. This one is an interesting one. It was an article in the Australian Fin Review last year, and it underscores the diversity in country of origin for CEOs from the top 50 companies on the ASX. Interestingly, almost half were born somewhere else. And I find this quite encouraging. So I'm not there yet. And I'm sure someone here today has either been there or will get there at some point. And for people getting there, we'll just remember the rest of us, okay, when you get there. And this is my last slide. And I think the first two are quite well known, illustrating an important difference between equality and equity. And the question I would like to ask everyone attending now is what label you might put under that third picture. And this is the point where I might hand over to Jess and, and we'll see if um, what everyone has to say about equality, equity, and what that last one can be, should be. Thank you, Jess. Thank you for sharing with us. It was, um, it was great to hear more about you and yeah, to hear some of, some of these stats. 